Now that you've found UBN Radio and discovered our quality talk shows, it's time to spread the word to friends, family, and the universe. 24 hours of music and talk. Radio without limits. That's why people keep coming back for more. That's UBNRadio.com. Jump off that exhausting hamster wheel and into balanced living with Dr. Marissa. Her mission, to be a beneficial presence on the planet. Her purpose, to be your personal advocate to live, love, laugh, learn. Her life motto, don't die wondering. Take back your life with Dr. Marissa Fett on UVNRadio.com. And welcome. You are tuned in to Take My Advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa every week on UBN on Tuesdays at naturally high noon and also on my syndicated CNBC News Radio channel, KCAA AM 1050. And this is a show about hope and happiness. So there's no gossip, no scandal, and no K words. No Kardashian talk at all, even though here at Sunset Gower Studios, if you saw my Instagram, it is where scandal does record. But there is no scandal on this show. Instead, we want you to focus on your own reality life and get to that happiness 88% of the time. So we have lots of fabulous guests. And first of all, I'd like to do my peace shout out for all my travels this week. I got to go to San Diego. One of the fun play work things I get to do is uh, as a board of director on the Alliant Educational Foundation. And I love taking the train. So a peace out to John on Amtrak for helping me. Uh, on the train and also a big thanks today if you've not noticed yet is my beautiful staff interpreter Sharon Pierre Lewis who is helping with our radio for our deaf community series and that's today so thank you very much Sharon and we, today we're honored to have Carlton Pearson a very successful and beloved evangelist out of the Oral Roberts tradition with tens of thousands in his ministry, award-winning vocalist, inspirational speaker and minister, appointed bishop in 96. But something happened, and we're going to find out firsthand, firsthand, and now Carlton speaks and stands for the gospel not of exclusion, but inclusion, speaking out against fundamentalism and has been on many venues, including 2020, Nightline, ABC, CBS, giving us all something to think about as an alternative to Satan, hate, and war. So if you enjoy Dr. Michael Bernard Beckwith, Marianne Williamson, and Don Miguel Ruiz on my show, you will absolutely enjoy my guest today. Welcome, Bishop Carl Carlton Pearson. <laughs> Sometimes I want to say like Bishop Pearson, Carlton, Carlton. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of stuff there. But welcome to the show. I'm so glad that you could make it. And you are skyping in from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Tulsa, Oklahoma. Peace in and peace out. <laughs> place I've lived for 43 years, even though I was born in San Diego, and I should I was out there last weekend, and I need to be there now. Yeah, so. yeah, I saw that in the bio. I had no idea. We should have nabbed you when you were out here, but this is good. Thank yeah. you to Skype. So I'm going to start with a, a, a question. Actually, it's a my friend. She doesn't have an answering machine, and when she calls the end, when you call her, her questioning machine comes on and says, "Who are you?" And what do you want? So that's my first question in today's interview. Who are you and what do you want? Well, what I want is me. I'll answer that part first. Um, what I always, I have a chapter in one of my books titled What You Want Wants You because what you want actually is you. You want to experience the most precise and accurate, exact uh, realization of who you are, not the impersonation and not the imposter that we tend to become in life trying to be what everybody else anticipates or expects mm -hmm. or even demands. But at 62 years old, I've come to the realization that all I've ever wanted is to experience the total me, the most uh, precise and, and accurate and exact and uh, honest, earnest, pure, unedited 
me. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't always like that because uh, when I heard you speak for many, many years, you became what was expected of you and what maybe fed your ego. So I want to take all my listeners back. Some of, I know I've got a lot of Agape Love Burrito peeps tuned in because they loved your talk at Agape. And I also have a very large listening base that is non-Agape. So I want to give um, you, a, I, I'm going to start with a rumor. Okay, so the rumor, and then you correct the rumor with the truth. So when I first heard about you, the rumor was that you were this really, really, really big uh, uh, TV, TV media evangelist. You would hold these huge meetings and, you know, you, you were a charismatic, uh, very uh, born again, Pentecostal, you know, speaking in tongues, holy roller, if I can use that term. Uh, very successful, had a following, tens, 50,000, huge, huge. And then something happened, and you were not okay with the gospel as you were preaching it. And you had like a little burning bush, uh, private burning bush experience, and woke up and now preach uh, this this gospel of inclusion. And so your, your words against Satan. Uh, I know you did a program on Nightline with um, Deepak Chopra uh, about Satan, and then you've spoken out against religion, against gays. Uh, you've done a lot of things that have earned you the, the title of non-fundamentalist. So you went from one extreme to the other. How much of that rumor is true? All of it. Oh, yay! <laughs> I love it when rumor All actually... <laughs> It's all close it. to the, all of it. So that's that's some hefty story. So take me back. So you grew up in uh, four generations of preachers. Okay, so, Classical Pentecostal preachers. Okay, so tell I'm me what a Pentecostal, what, what's that? What's their number one belief so that those who are not Pentecostal understand? Well, the, the, one, the number one belief is transcendence, that you can have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ and that you can communicate with your spirit to spirit in tongues and out of that transcendent experience you get revelations and you see and you hear and you can get answers to life's questions and problems basically the same thing that all religions hope to to uh, to effectuate in a person's life but ours uh, was classical pentecostalism which really began uh, at the turn of the century in 1906 at the azusa street outpour in los angeles the great revival that most pentecostal denominations trace their roots to your mecca Yes. And so, you know, laying on of hands, casting out of devils, healing of the sick, prophesying, all that kind of stuff was part of um, uh, the keynote of that particular d d group. And I still embrace a lot of that. But the fundamental part about hell and an angry God or a God with a terrible anger management problem <laughs> yes. uh, who throws tantrums, whether that's uh, cancer or AIDS or eternal torture chambers, I moved away from all of that kind of excess, and I still embrace the the belief in a transcendent reality mm -hmm. that goes beyond religion, goes beyond human frailties and weaknesses and and uh, parameters, mm -hmm. and that you can you can uh, access your spirit through your spirit and be free. Right, and, right. And that's what upset um, a lot of the my fundamentalist people who believe that only Christians were going to heaven and that everybody else was going to hell. Even my 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 evaluations of heaven and hell have shifted and continue mm -hmm. to unfold as I do. Right. So it's a freeing evolutionary journey that I'm on right now, and I'm happier than I've ever been in my life. That's great. That's great. If you've just tuned in, you are listening to a man talking about heaven and hell, and that is Bishop Carlton Pearson. He's my guest today on Take My Advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa. And if you're tuning in and you are religious and it is working for you, then fabulous and you really don't need to listen anymore. I brought Bishop Carlton on here because there is, there are many, 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 many people like myself who did grow up fundamental. I grew up fundamental Baptist, and I, you know, went to church like six days a week, and 
I got to a point where it wasn't working for me. The anger, the, the God that was angry all the time, who was going to send my grandfather, who did not believe in him, to hell, wasn't working for me. And then so I left. And I say that fundamental uh, Christianity sometimes is a precursor to atheism or agnosticism. And that's where I found myself for many years. But I did come back. And like you said... I love the way you said that. You still believe some of the, some of it, but the things that were based on exclusive hate, I can call it, those yeah. are the things that you left. And what struck me, and I want you to speak to uh, a little of it, that relationship with yourself. I love the way you talked about the relationship with yourself and how, you know, how do you get to that place where you love yourself? Because if we look at religion religion is supposed to help you feel good about yourself and your life. I mean, I think that's why people are gravitate towards something to make you feel good. So you were in that, but you didn't feel good about yourself. Why? Well, uh, the religion teaches you to, to deny, denounce, and demean yourself. It has... You, you're groveling, trying to reach God and appease an angry God or please a difficult one. Most religions are based on that kind of concept. So you don't like yourself. You need to be changed and transformed to the likeness of God in Christ. Uh, that your humanness is, is your, your major liability. Mm. And that human beings being human is not acceptable. Right. So I believe that about myself and I... I I actually, I was into such self-loathing and I didn't realize that I'd become comfortable, if you will, uh, in this whole idea of hating me and everything about me that was human or natural or nurtured uh, was, was wrong. So I had to be somebody else that God would like or, quote unquote, the people of God would accept. Right, right. Those are mostly fundamentalist Christians. Everybody else was going to hell and love the devil and off and crazy and demonic and heretical as now they say I am. Um, that's changing, though. That group is, um, I mean, I hear from literally thousands of them who are saying, please don't stop, Bishop. I, I love the way you're thinking and talking. And uh, you talk about new thought. The new thinking is actually happening more yes. in that fundamentalist group, whether they're Muslim, Jews, or Christians. There's this new awakening that's, they're, they're thinking, you know, maybe this is not working. It, I'm not happy. I'm not mm -hmm. fulfilled. I'm not satiated. There's got to be more. Right, right, absolutely. And we've come along just at the time to, to help them make that transition. I feel like I'm kind of a midwife uh, <laughs> helping birth this wonderful new uh, awakening, and it's, it's profound. That's great. Yeah, because it, it, I think you uh, said that concept of you can be religious and still feel like you're living in hell on earth. Yes. So, so if that's why I, 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 I do say that tongue-in-cheek, but also in all earnestness. If, if religion works for you and you feel that you are loved, loving, and lovable most of the time, then great. But if you are like someone who, who like me, I probably uh, six, seven years ago, no matter what I did, no matter what I said, no matter how many accomplishments I, I achieved, no matter how many people told me how great I was or how fabulous I was, there was always that voice or yeah. that little inside that said, you know, well, they don't really know you or, you know, that, that's, this is not going to last and they don't know who you really are. And if they knew, they wouldn't love you or they wouldn't think that much. And that voice, that constant criticism, that was my devil. You know, when they used to say, listen to the still small voice, I would go, no, because <laughs> that still small voice is beating the crap out of me. So, yeah. so how, in that journey now, so you gave up a lot though. I mean, you gave up a lot, a lot. Well, I, I had spent my life as a fourth generation classical Pentecostal preacher, uh, going, playing by the rules. Um, I fasted and prayed anywhere from three to 40 days. I lived a life of cleanness and clarity and consecration, and I uh, denied myself all the things I thought Jesus was teaching, and all the things I thought my parents and godparents and grandparents and my bishops and leaders wanted and expected of me. And I climbed up the ranks to where I was a very well-known, very highly respected and regarded uh, cleric. My church had over 5,000 people coming a week. 
Uh, I had millions by way of television and radio ministry. I've, I'm a stellar award winner, gospel twice. I've won the stellar award gospel recording. I had 50,000 people coming to Tulsa once a year for a week. Um, 30 to 50,000 coming through. You know, we presented uh, preachers and singers, and uh, I wrote 14 books and traveled all over the world and preached to as many as a quarter of a million people live. Mm-hmm. In one stadium and that many standing on the outside. So I I maximized what I thought was my potential in that particular discipline. But I was still hungry. I was still felt like I was missing something. I started getting bored with my success, bored with my my ministry. Mm. And I went through that for about 10 years before I got to the place where I just said, there's got to be a change here, something I'm missing it. And I began to pray and I still fast and pray. I still pray for the sick. I still believe in the anointing of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. And I operate in that genre when I I minister. Um, But the dogma of of an angry God that that was dismissing billions of people to an eternal torture chamber where they could never, ever be free again, that that God would be eternally angry, eternally vindictive, Mm -hmm. eternally hateful. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole concept of hell, as we've been taught it, is vulgar and obscene. And that God would be eternally torturing my brother Mm -hmm. and members of my family and friends whom I loved uh, was inconsistent with the moral character of a loving God. So my religion had taught me uh, sort of a schizophrenic type approach that that uh, God was good and evil and more evil than good because most of the people would be tortured by him. And that was the male gender reference to God. So I started sorting through all that. I I majored in biblical literature, English Bible in college, and I minored in theology and historical studies. So I, I did exhaustive studying of the scripture. And the more I studied, the more I realized that the greatest story ever told was probably just the greatest story ever sold and that we had bought into it. (laughs) Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> that was a stunning revelation. It right. made me sick um, for a while. Physically, it was nauseous to me to believe that maybe we got it wrong. Mm. So I saw it through we, all. Do you think that. we had got it wrong? Do you think? Do you think that uh, the line you said was, um, "It's more important what God says, what Jesus says about God, than what what the, the church, church says, says about, about Jesus." Jesus. Yeah. yeah. So I, I guess my thing still is the the necessity that religion says you ha- you cannot get to god directly you need some kind of intermediary whether it be jesus or krishna or whatever that that in between and and the you know the born again uh, verbiage, you know, that you have to confess your sins. It's still all based that there's something wrong with us. Can you talk to that a bit? Well, when I first started preaching the gospel of inclusion I and wrote that book, um, I believed in a God who required blood sacrifices based on the Judaic Christian mentality of uh, atonement, that God was basically angry. Of course, all religions have felt that the gods were angry or could be angered and therefore developed moral codes and doctrines and disciplines to appease this angry God or please a difficult one. Mm-hmm. Billions of, of the people on the planet believe that. Two billion Christians, another two billion Muslims, uh, several hundred million Jews, uh, and other religions tend to believe that God is angry or can be angered. And so we've developed religions to... to uh, to appease these angry gods. Right. Uh, and I think that has created a psychosis on the planet that makes us angry and fearful and uh, frightening, not just frightened, but frightening people mm-hmm. that we would do to hu- other human beings what we assume an angry God would do. Hitler mm-hmm. called himself a follower of Jesus and called Jesus his Lord and thought that what he was doing with the, the infernals in Germany was to um, to help God burn Right. He, thought he thought he was, he was doing that in right. the name of Jesus. Yes. So, so, but what if, what for, now I'm going to go to the other side and put the moose on the table. So for people who say that if we don't have religion, if we don't have a moral compass, if we don't have that faith 
that believes in a God that is a just God, that we're all going to turn into Sodom and Gomorrah and we're all going to just be uh, completely moral less or moral compass less. And so uh, I, I, I don't believe this, but I've heard that, uh, you know, the fundamental Christian saying the fact that, you know, gay marriage has been passed is just an example of how things are progressing to the point uh, of, or of immorality. I do not believe that, absolutely, but I'm putting that moose on the table just so you, of all people, are one who is qualified to address that. Well, what you make the issue, you ultimately make the idol. Uh, Christians, fundamental Christians, come from a sexually uh, uh, suppressed consciousness that your, your sexuality and your sensuality and your sociology is all debased and debauchery and that we are intrinsically evil. We have this terrible preoccupation with sexual sins because from my experience in fundamental Christianity, there is this incredible attraction to sexual sins. We were taught from, from children in fundamentalism, don't touch the girls, don't hold hands with the girls, the girls are evil, they could take you down, sex is terrible. I know many ministers who are fundamentalists who have terrible issue, rela sexual relations with their spouses because they have this, this sense in their mind that sex is wrong, mm -hmm. it's evil, mm -hmm. and that women tend to be evil. And they bring down great men. And so the misogyny, the chauvinism, this whole idea of opposite sex uh, means it sends a subliminal signal that she opposes you or he opposes her. And uh, we've got it all wrong. And so... There's this continual preoccupation with what I think is a subtle interest in same-sex attraction, uh, or there would be less emphasis upon it. This mm -hmm. whole idea of homosexuality is something that, that the fundamentalist church freaks over. But yes. I, from my experience, the guys or people who preach the loudest and the longest up against something are dealing profoundly with it in their own lives. Mm. Uh, what you, uh, as, as, as it said, what you attack, what you, what you fight, you ignite, you invite, and you incite. Uh -huh. With all this anti-sex stuff we've preached over the last several decades in this country, the gays, quote-unquote, gay agenda is in place. Mm -hmm. Gay marriage will ultimately be in every, every state. Uh, uh, women's rights or abortion or the women's power of choice or right to choose is going to remain in place uh we can fight we can fight cigarettes we fought cigarettes we fought alcohol now we're fighting pot everything we fight we lose mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> the fundamentalists right. and so there's this sense of depression and defeat and uh disenchantment among fundamentalists i remember how defeated i felt when i was in that camp and seeing that we were losing ground mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's an old paradigm. It, that particular posture will never last. And so uh, the, the anti and you can't talk about homosexuality without talking about human sexuality, that we are sexual, sensual, social, and spiritual beings. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no way for you to look at another attractive human being uh, or human being to whom you are attracted and ignore the fact that there's a sensual observation and ad admiration you, you admire and you can ultimately de desi desire another human being yeah. to whom you're not married. Right. Oh, okay. While you're married. Right. Uh, it's, it's, it's disingenuous to say that's not true. Right. Uh, so there's also sexual attractions. And there's so, we love to be with, around other human beings. And, of course, there's a spiritual connection that's mystical. Mm -hmm. But it's so profoundly present and powerful uh, in our lives. So instead of fighting this to stop and say, okay, what's wrong with this beautiful attraction I have to other human beings? Even though I may have a covenant with a single person, wife or husband, uh, whether they're gay or straight, you have these covenant relationships or contracts that you decide to enter into. Right. Nobody can make that decision for you. Right. Once you've made it, then you're committed to that as long as you're committed to it. But, but to make rules around it and put stringent uh, restrictions on it against which we all rebel at some point yeah. uh yeah. is now becoming an exercise in futility there's a 50 percent to 67 percent divorce rate throughout the country across the board right. and more among fundamentalists than atheists 
Interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, yes. Special oh, it's part much of higher. Much yeah. higher. And and again, I I believe I'm totally for that because I've said let's change the until death do us part to until we or until we both shall live to until we both shall not love. <laughs> so, so we'll, we'll, you know, and, uh, Ricky was on the show and she said, you know, every year with Michael, they have on their anniversary, they decide, do we want to do this another year? I think yeah. it's a great, it's, I call it the lease with the option to extend the marriage. And I do agree too, that religion has put that rule in place. And I know in my generation, um, well, in my parents' generation, there were many, many marriages that should not have stayed together. And then now, maybe there are many divorces that people didn't try more hard enough to stay together because they don't know how. So we're getting to that point of balance, I'm hoping. But still, if we don't have the rules, if we don't have the morality uh, coming from the church, we, in and of ourselves... I believe, can be, and it's not even about moral, but we can be that which it is that we're supposed to be, which is um, spiritual beings having a human experience and and living and loving life 88% of the time. And when we go through hardships, those are the alchemy to create and expand who we are to that fine point or to that beautiful diamond finish. That, to me, makes so much more sense than coming onto this planet, being born with the rules or this, this parent that's going to slap a side of the head if we make if we cross a rule line, especially when it comes to what you're, you're saying in, in the natural sexual order of things, which, by the way, I don't know if you know, I do a monthly series now called Sexual Healing with Dr. Marissa, a direct result of marrying spirituality, sexuality, and sensuality. Because I know that if I'm fully alive, that is a dang big part of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and well, you know, we are we are naturally sexual, naturally sensual, naturally social, and naturally spiritual. We are not naturally marital. It's <laughs> easy to be sexual. It's easy to be social. It's easy to be sensual. It comes very natural to be spiritual. But it's a, an effort and a chore to be marital in the sense that you make this covenant. I believe, and this is, a, this is a very controversial statement, it's going to make possibly some of your listeners uncomfortable. I believe that God created sex, but that the church created marriage to control sex. And sex really is not controllable. You can put limits on it. Uh, to assume that we are innately or intrinsically immoral is to assume that God created us without conscience and or without consciousness. Now, we we are intrinsically good and intrinsically God or godly, but it is, but we're not intrinsically religious. Mm -hmm. That's something that is forced upon us and that we try to submit to. We don't have, we are innately spiritual. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. As you said earlier, we're not just human beings looking for spiritual experiences. We're a spirit having an earthly encounter. Mm -hmm. And so we have a mind, we have a body, but we are essence. We are spirit. We are immortal, immeasurable, immediate, and immutable beings, but we're fitting into this human structure, this incarnation or incarceration of a body that has physical, biological, philosophic, uh, physiological functions, whether that's urinating or defecating or, or, or saliva or, you know, the bodily fluids, blood and sweat and, and uh, you know, eating and, and eliminating, that's, that's all biological. The spiritual part is the easiest part. But when we, but being human is the more challenging aspect, mm -hmm. and so we've developed religion, assuming that our humanness is evil and does and is not liked by mm -hmm. the gods or mm -hmm. God, mm -hmm. uh, and we have, and to we have a very confused uh, opinion of all of that. So, mm -hmm. re-presenting what we believe and why we believe it and how those beliefs add to or subtract to the quality of our lives is very important right now in this twenty yeah. first century. Yeah, I call that. Uh, Instead of blind faith, we are now going towards 2020 faith. 
So we want to choose yeah. wow. to see what it is for ourselves. Absolutely. And I just got the signal. We are up against our promo time to thank those sponsors that make shows on the air like this possible. So we'll be back in two and two. Peace in and peace out. What if the books you read your children empowered them and built their self-worth? Shine Your Light Books publishes stories for children that encourage love, unity, inner peace, and optimism. Their latest title, Forensies Light, is the inspirational tale of a firefly who must decide whether to keep her light hidden or let it shine for everyone to see. Through colorful illustrations and engaging storytelling, Frenzy's Light encourages young readers to be confident in themselves and find their authentic gifts. This beautiful hardcover book is available at www.shineyourlightbooks.com and amazon.com. Visit Shine Your Light Books Facebook page to see how you can win a signed copy of Frenzy's Light and let's shine the light on our children today. Come and fall into fun. Celebrate the beautiful colors of autumn with unique, timeless treasures boutiques. From jewelry, clothing, and accessories to Halloween goodies, it's family fun for everyone, including story time and a crafts table for kids of all ages. Gourmet food sampling, free parking, and free admission are even more reasons to come to Huntington Beach September 17th through 20th and Lakewood, California, September 23rd to 26th. And mention Dr. Marissa for a free gift. For more information, go to www.timelesstreasuresboutiques.com. That's www.timelesstreasuresboutiques.com for fun, frolic, and artisan adventure. And welcome back. You are tuned in to Take My Advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa every Tuesday at Naturally High Noon, Thursdays at 7, and Saturdays at noon on my syndicated CNBC News Radio, KCAA AM 1050. And today we are at the Sunset Gower Studios. Uh, with with the Universal Broadcasting Network, and my guest today is the very um, orator. You are one of the best orators I know. You have this wonderful way with words. But more important than that, Bishop Carlton Pearson is a man who left uh, fundamental teachings and preaching of exclusion and hate to now preach the gospel of inclusion. And for that, I want to present you with Dr. Marissa's Beneficial Presence on the Planet Award. So, thank you. <laughs> it may mean a whole lot more one day, but for right now, it means a lot to me because I don't give it out every week and my listeners know that. So I do, I do want it, uh, I did want you to come and, and share this because you have such a unique perspective of coming from something so strong and you were really steeped in it. And then, uh, you know, standing up for a, a completely different way of looking at life and looking at humanity. So in that vein, do you think for, okay, first, what would you say to people who, um, don't believe in a God? So you said spirituality comes naturally. Um, there, there's a bigger population now of agnostics and atheists, I think, than there has been in the past. I, this is not verified, but that's my guess, uh, based on many people who had the similar experience as I did, got disillusioned with their upbringing. What would you say to people who say, there is no proof? I, how do you, how, how can I trust in a God when things like 9-11 happen, when things like uh, all these things happen, and and uh, how how can we how can we trust in something that is so uh, is everything is so contrary? I remember walking into a room and somebody said, um, "Oh, there there's Dr. Marissa. She she preaches a friendly universe." And this woman turned around and goes, "How can you believe in a friendly universe with all this crap that's going on in the world?" And I say, "I don't watch the news. That helps." <laughs> <laughs> constantly negative news on CNN. But but what's your answer? Well, I believe in the power of consciousness 
individual and collective consciousness and that we do as a human race and as human beings create the reality we experience by the way we think and the way we believe and by the energy that we share with each other and uh, that as quote unquote created beings we're both created creative and thirdly creating we are actually uh, in our divine essence creating a reality unconsciously our objective people like you and me and michael and others that you would mention uh, who are uh, new thought advocates or believe in expanded consciousness. We want people to create intentionally, to create deliberately, to create awareingly by awakening their consciousness to consciousness mm. uh, and reminding them that they are spiritual or that we are spirit beings and spiritual beings and not just humans uh, alone. So uh, to, uh, uh, to, to believe in a, in a personal God rather than a principle of divinity uh, is a struggle. When you believe in a personal God, all you can do is point the finger. Why is there poverty? Why is there death? Why is there, quote unquote, a devil? Why do evil things happen? Mm -hmm. Why are evil people allowed to prevail? Why are there wars? If you are personal and you're affecting the and directing the affairs of, of humankind, but to say there's a principle of divinity that we are part and parcel of and that we do affect and influence with our thinking and our essence, then that puts the responsibility back on us to create peace on earth mm. and not point the finger at all the evils that are out there, but do mm. what we can to change the thinking mm -hmm. of the planet. Right. And uh, this, we've come late, but this is not, as we say, this is not just new thought. This is ancient wisdom. Correct. Correct. Absolutely. And so we're trying to reclaim, recollect, remember the mm -hmm. dismembered self and soul of the human race. And when we do that, we will produce peace on this planet. I still believe it's possible. E, do you still believe it's possible with all of the things that go on, even in our backyard with the race relations, the way they are, that's becoming like an oxymoron? Ferguson, you know what I'm talking about. So yeah. how, how do you... That doesn't seem like we're getting any closer. It seems like we're getting further. Well, as long as there are races, there's going to be racism. That's human nature. There's always going to be, excuse the terminology, fecal matter. <laughs> it's what you do. <laughs> what, shiitake? It's natural <laughs> to, to eliminate certain things. Uh, where you eliminate it, when you eliminate it, and how you eliminate it is what we work on. Not that we eliminate that we have um. functions that seem unpleasant and should be more private. That's just life. Mm -hmm. uh, what you do with fertilizer, because it's going to exist, mm -hmm. how you fertilize things to make them live, all the f dung that's been thrown at me by fundamentalists, I've turned it into fertilizer and I've grown through it. Mm. I made okay. good evil. I mean, <laughs> what would be considered evil good. And mm -hmm. I believe, as I alluded when I was at, with, when I was at Agape a few weeks ago, that uh, scripture says that the God said, now they have become like us, knowing good and evil, or the good and evil, or good as evil, mm -hmm. or the evil and good. And if everything that is created was created by God, and everything that is created, God created it, and everything God created is good, then what is evil except some kind of a of, a, of an abstract good, some kind mm -hmm. of distortion of good. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do is sort through all these distortions and abstract appraisals and bring some clarity and divinity to them so that they're in their right place mm -hmm. and in their ordained or in divine order. Everything, when it's in divine order, we can all work through this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've just got this planetary disorder because the preachers and teachers have not taught a clear precise, non-religious approach to living. And we're trying to become non or less religious and more spiritual in touch with our essence. And that's why the drug movement is so popular. People are not evil because they take drugs. They're trying to transcend a reality. Mm. They're trying to, to, to deaden their senses to the pain of that which they can't con control. Mm -hmm. And they get into this ethereal or this otherness you know, when the scripture says you must be born again, the Greek word for again is anothen, where we get the English word another. Another or an ether, ether, other, ethereal realities. See what I mean about the words? Yes. 
essence. <laughs> I love it. Uh, we can go there. And when we get there, whether it took a joint or a meditation, whatever it takes for you to get to that ethereal reality mm -hmm. where you can discern and decipher it and decide more clearly, we need to do it. Uh -huh. Are you giving, that sounds like permission to do drugs all the time. <laughs> it sounds kind of good to me. You know, I've never done drugs. I can't imagine that when I'm in meditation rather than medication, but the reason people meditated, uh, Dr. Rose, you may know this, the reason they went into meditation <laughs> was to decipher or discern the medication to address pain management. We mm -hmm. develop coping mechanisms as human beings, mm -hmm. behavioral modifications, or pain management. Yeah. It's all about managing if not completely alleviate, alleviating pain. We don't know how to alleviate it. We do know how to manage it. It's the managing style, the management style, mm -hmm. whether you use drugs or whether you use money or, uh, you know, whether it's a pork chop or a piece of chocolate cake that you're addicted to, whatever it is, there are various, there are different levels of ways to manage the pain. Mm -hmm. If we find the more correct herbal, natural remedies, mm -hmm. We're, we're better off. Right. Uh, so we're trying to say, let's just, let's just change the remedies. Right. So we meditate and at times medicate, but with good herbal essence from the planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is, it is, as you said, there's a growing body uh, that are a, new thought, ancient wisdom. It's, it's a, re it's a wonderful response to the growing dis-ease that I have seen in life. So there's more and more people that come to midlife opportunity, which I get to work with on the air and off that are not happy. See, I'm words back at you, bud, um, uh, that are not happy with their lives, that it's just this huge magnanimous, no, not mag, huge uh, uh, movement of unhappiness, of, of complaining, of this yeah. dis-ease with life. And so the prescription seems to be either pharmaceuticals, which still absolutely makes me laugh every time I hear a commercial by accident with the side effects. So yeah. you're, which are not side effects by the fact, by, by the way, they are main effects. I had, yes. a, had an author on here saying those are main effects. They happen. It's not a side. So, so we've got, and I'm glad because I have more and more clients that come to me and say, I'm on drugs. I'm on uh, doc, doctor prescribed drugs, but I want off. I want, and, and even sure. if they're um, non-pharmaceutical, my commercial for to get off drugs is if there's there's non side effect non prescription non pharmaceutical ways to make your soul feel at peace and connected with the the incredible magnificent person that you are and and you don't need to take anything for that because you are already that which you said earlier. So well, I'm just the word the word addiction, the base of that is dictation or dictatorship. Diction. You're actually hearing a voice that says you cannot sleep without this pill, or you cannot be happy without a piece of chocolate cake, or you cannot be at peace unless you're drunk. Mm. Uh, these are voices we hear. We have to determine what voices we hear what voices we listen to, and what voices we respond to. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all about what you hear. There's a scripture that says, faith cometh by hearing. You, 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 what you hear, you tend to believe. Right. And so you have to go learn how to distinguish between what you believe, which is what you've heard, and what you know, which is what you've experienced. What your soul, your cells, your essence experiences about you and about God is what's really real. Anything else is an illusion. Mm -hmm. So at this age in my life, I am determining and distinguishing and discerning the difference between what I believe and what I know. And that's the only conflict that I'm experiencing. I know and everybody knows they're okay. Everybody knows they're secure. Everybody knows they are loved and they are loved. Everybody knows they are at peace. Everybody knows that they are healthy mm. and happy and whole, but they don't believe it. Mm. So they're wrestling. When you don't believe that you're secure, you'll rob a bank. When you don't believe that you're loved, you'll kill somebody. When you don't believe that you're secure, you will operate out of the fear of alienation. So changing our thinking and, 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 and bridging, if you will, 
the, the, the distance from what we believe to what we know or remembering our mm-hmm. dismembered self is, is the healing mm-hmm. that the planet needs. Yeah, yeah. It's totally. a slow process, but I believe in it. Yeah, I do too. So we're coming up against the end of our time, but I wanted to first, how do we find you to support you and to keep up with you and to be inspired by your words? Carlton Pearson, uh, bishoppearson.com or carltonpearson.com. Um, those are my sites. Uh, you can ask me any question on there. I have a live or I have a presentation every Thursday night between 830 and 930. But you can archive any of that at my sites, the lectures, my books, my CDs. Um, anybody who wants speaking engagements can go to that site and, and order uh, or, or make an invitation or whatever. Mm-hmm. And uh, I love to come. I love to speak. I love your show. I love what you're doing. I love you, Dr. Marissa. Aww. I believe that you have been divinely ordained for this hour. Mm. You're speaking such life and truth into people's souls mm. and they're listening. And many people you'll never, ever meet or know heard you. Their lives are being changed. Aww. This is going out there. And so I greatly salute you, honor you, respect you, and support you. Yes, yes. You've, ta- you've taken the risk. Thank you so much. And finally, is there anything that you would like to um, say or a, a, a love shout out? I, I All my guests get a chance to, to say something. Rick O'Berry uh, gave a shout out to his family. So any, anybody you want to say hi to, I want to say thank you to your assistant, Michelle, who was fabulous in getting you you. here. But is there anyone that you would like to give a shout out to or wishes that you have for any listeners or the world? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to quote uh, one of our recently transitioned. Oh, Dr. Dyer. In Mm. new thought. And that's Wayne Dyer who made his transition just in the last couple of weeks this is the one of the most profound statements I've ever heard. I'm going to leave it with your listeners and mm-hmm. with you because it's profound in my own life. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Mm-hmm. Perception is the ultimate reality, but not necessarily the ultimate truth. Mm-hmm. We have to reconsider what we believe, why we believe it, and how those beliefs add to or subtract from the quality of our lives. Mm-hmm. The power of thought, so creative, so inventive, uh, let's change our thinking and change our world. That's in our hands. We have that power. We have that privilege. We have that uh, uh, control. Yeah. And so I offer to all your listeners, I love you. I love them. I love mm-hmm. us. Yes. And I believe that our best is next and yet to come. Wonderful. Well said. Thank you so much. <laughs> and I love you too. <laughs> Thank you, precious. We'll do it again. Absolutely. Yeah, I was just talking to him. Uh, we're going to try to get the three-pack powerhouse here. Neil Donald Walsh, uh, Bishop Carlton, and my big brother, Dr. Michael Bernard Beckwith. Wouldn't that yes. be fabulous? So let's all like send all our manifestation wiggly fingers out there so it'll happen in the next year. Thanks again. All right, we are at the end of the show. Time for the balance bar, which is... The time where I ask you to join you and join me and support me in all of my peace work around the planet. I will be, uh, con- I'm still building my 21 day fast from complaining app with Dr. Marissa. And if you go to gofundme.com forward slash H R A X A H. R-A-X-L-O, you will find the link and you can help with that. And it, it is, uh, we're getting there. I'm hoping to have a launch for the new year. Uh, today is day 15 on the, the 21 Day Fast from Complaining. If you are a complainer uh, about yourself, many women complain that they are fatter, not as attractive and not as smart as they actually are. And in fact, they are more beautiful. And so I ask you to have a guy day. That's today's balance tip. Guys, most guys think they're better looking, more buff and have more hair than they actually do. So let's adopt women and not complain so much by having a guy day. So that's your tip for that. Uh, The Asian Oprah giveaway is a pack of my 52 card. Pick me up stacking the deck for life balance with Dr. Marissa. First one to LinkedIn message. Message me will get me get one of those. Uh, if you are not a friend of mine on Facebook already, please do so. As well, I will be this uh, at the end of this month uh, emceeing both for the Asian Enterprise 
awards that I was uh, very blessed with getting in 2014, the uh, Best in Entrepreneurship, and I'll be hosting that at the Beverly Hilton. So for more information on that, go to AsianEnterprise.com, as well the Asian Women Entrepreneurs. I will be uh, emceeing that awards luncheon, two very fabulous, honorable places that you can spend your money energy if you'd like to support the Asian um, entrepreneurs. And next week, you cannot miss it. I'm getting her back. She's beloved by Oprah. She's been on many times. She's been on my show twice already. Janine Roth, mega bestseller, Women, Food, and God, and my favorite book, When You Eat at the Refrigerator, pull up a chair. So she'll, she'll be on next week. And thanks again to Sharon. Next week we'll have um, Rowena coming on to be staff interpreter. So we will have another radio for a deaf community. So tune in for Take My Advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa Pay. That's P for positive E-I. And remember, it's all about balance. Peace in and peace out. Someone who, who, like me, I probably uh, six, seven years ago, no matter what I did, no matter what I said, no matter how many accompli- accomplishments I, I achieved, no matter how many people told me how great I was or how fabulous I was, there was always that voice or yeah. that little inside that said, you know, well, they don't really know you or, you know, that that's this is not going to last and they don't know who you really are. And if they knew, they wouldn't love you or they wouldn't think that much. And so that voice, that constant criticism, that was my devil. You know, when they used to say, listen to the still small voice, I would go, no, because <laughs> that still small voice is beating the crap out of me so so how in that journey now so you gave up a lot though i mean you gave up a lot a lot well i i had spent my life as a fourth generation classical pentecostal preacher uh going playing by the rules um i fasted and prayed anywhere from three to 40 days I lived a life of cleanness and clarity and consecration, and I uh, denied myself all the things I thought Jesus was teaching, and all the things I thought my parents and godparents and grandparents and my bishops and leaders wanted and expected of me. And I climbed up the ranks to where I was a very well known, very highly respected and regarded uh, cleric. My church had over 5,000 people coming a week. Uh, I had millions by way of television and radio ministry. I've, I'm a stellar award winner gospel twice. I've won the stellar award gospel recording. I had 50,000 people coming to Tulsa once a year for a week. Um, 30 to 50,000 coming through. You know, we presented uh, preachers and singers and I wrote 14 books and traveled all over the world and preached to as many as a quarter of a million people live. Mm-hmm in one stadium and that many standing on the outside. So I, I maximized what I thought was my potential in that particular discipline, but I was still hungry. I was still felt like I was missing something. I started getting bored with my success, bored with my, my ministry. Mm. And I went through that for about 10 years before I got to the place where I just said, there's gotta be a change here, something I'm missing it. And I began to pray and I still fast and pray I still pray for the sick. I still believe in the anointing of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. And I operate in that genre when I, when I minister. Um, but the dogma of, of an angry God that was, that was dismissing billions of people to an eternal torture chamber where they could never, ever be free again, that that God would be eternally angry, eternally vindictive, mm-hmm. eternally hateful. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole concept of hell, as we've been taught it, is vulgar and obscene. And that God would be eternally torturing my brother mm -hmm. and members of my family and friends whom I loved uh, was inconsistent with the moral character of a loving God. So my religion had taught me uh, sort of a schizophrenic type approach that that uh, God working for me. And then so I left. And I say that fundamental uh, Christianity sometimes is a precursor to atheism or agnosticism. And that's where I found myself for many years. But I did come back. And like you said, I love the way you said that you still believe some of the, some of it. But the things that were based on exclusive hate, I can call it. Those yeah. are the things that you left. And what struck me, and I want you to speak to uh, a little of it, that relationship with yourself. I love the way you talked about the relationship with yourself and how, you know, how do you get to that place where you love yourself? Because if we look at religion, religion is supposed to help you feel good about yourself and your life. I mean, I think that's why people or gravitate towards something to make you feel good. So you were in that, but you didn't feel good about yourself. Why? Well, the religion teaches you to, to deny, denounce, and demean yourself. It has, you, you're groveling, trying to reach God and appease an angry God or please a difficult one. Most religions are based on that kind of concept. So you don't like yourself. You need to be changed and transformed to the likeness of God in Christ, uh, that your humanness is, is your, your major liability mm. and that human beings being human is not acceptable. Right. So I believe that about myself. And I, I, I actually, I was into such self-loathing and I didn't realize that I'd become comfortable, if you will, uh, in this whole idea of hating me and everything about me that was human or mm. natural or nurtured uh, was was wrong. So I had to be somebody else that God would like or, quote, unquote, the people of God would accept. Right, right. Those are mostly fundamentalist Christians. Everybody else was going to hell and love the devil and off and crazy and demonic and heretical, as now they say I am. Um, that's changing, though. That group is, um, I mean, I hear from literally thousands of them who are saying, please don't stop, Bishop. I, I love the way you're thinking and talking. And uh, you talk about new thought. The new thinking is actually happening more yes. in that fundamentalist group, whether they're Muslim, Jews, or Christians. There's this new awakening that's they're, – they're thinking, you know, maybe this is not working. It, I'm not happy. I'm not mm -hmm. fulfilled. I'm not satiated. There's got to be more. Right, right. Absolutely. And we've come along just at the time to, to help them make that transition. I feel like I'm kind of a midwife uh, <laughs> helping birth this wonderful new uh, awakening, and it's, it's profound. That's great. Yeah, because it, it, I think you uh, said that concept of you can be religious and still feel like you're living in hell on earth. Yes. So, so if that's why I I, I I do say that tongue in cheek, but also in all earnestness, if if religion works for you and you feel that you are loved, loving, and lovable most of the time, then great. But if you are like Now that you've found UBN Radio and discovered our quality talk shows, it's time to spread the word to friends, family, and the universe. 24 hours of music and talk. Radio without limits. That's why people keep coming back for more. That's UBNRadio.com. Jump off that exhausting hamster wheel and into balanced living with Dr. Marissa. to be a beneficial presence on the planet. Her purpose, to be your personal advocate to live, love, laugh, learn. Her life motto, don't die wondering. Take back your life with Dr. Marissa Fett on UVNRadio.com. And welcome. You are tuned in to Take My Advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa every week on UBN on Tuesdays at Naturally High Noon and also on my syndicated CNBC News Radio channel, KCAA AM 1050. And this is a show about hope 
and happiness. So there's no gossip, no scandal, and no K-words. No Kardashian talk at all. Even though here at Sunset Gower Studios, if you saw my Instagram, it is where scandal does record. But there is no scandal on this show. Instead, we want you to focus on your own reality life and get to that happiness 88% of the time. So we have lots of fabulous guests. And first of all, I'd like to do my peace shout out for all my travels this week. I got to go to San Diego. One of the fun play work things I get to do is uh, as a board of director on the Alliant Educational Foundation. And I love taking the train. So a peace out to John on Amtrak for helping me. Uh, on the train and also a big thanks today if you've not noticed yet is my beautiful staff interpreter Sharon Pierre Lewis who is helping with our radio for our deaf community series and that's today so thank you very much Sharon and we, today we're honored to have Carlton Pearson a very successful and beloved evangelist out of the Oral Roberts tradition with tens of thousands in his ministry, award-winning vocalist, inspirational speaker and minister, appointed bishop in 96. But something happened, and we're going to find out firsthand, firsthand. And now Carlton speaks and stands for the gospel, not of exclusion, but inclusion speaking out against fundamentalism and has been on many venues, including 2020, Nightline, ABC, CBS, giving us all something to think about as an alternative to Satan, hate, and war. So if you enjoy Dr. Michael Bernard Beckwith, Marianne Williamson, and Don Miguel Ruiz on my show, you will absolutely enjoy my guest today. Welcome, Bishop Carl Carlton Pearson. <laughs> Sometimes uh, you've done a lot of things that have earned you the the title of non-fundamentalist. So you went from one extreme to the other. How much of that rumor is true? All of it. Oh, yay. <laughs> I love it when rumor all actually it. is all close to the, all of it. So that's, that's some hefty story. So take me back. So you grew up in uh, four generations of preachers. Okay, so, Classical Pentecostal preachers. Okay, so tell I'm me what a Pentecostal, what, what's that, what's their number one belief so that those who are not Pentecostal understand? Well, the, the, one, the number one belief is transcendence, that you can have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ and that you can communicate with your spirit to spirit in tongues. And out of that transcendent experience, you get revelations and you see and you hear and you can get answers to life's questions and problems. Basically the same thing that all religions hope to, to, uh, to effectuate in a person's life. But ours uh, was classical Pentecostalism, which really began uh, at the turn of the century in 1906 at the Azusa Street Outpour in Los Angeles, the great revival that mm. most Pentecostal denominations trace their roots to. Your Mecca. Uh, yes. <laughs> and so, you know, laying on of hands, casting out of devils, healing of the sick, prophesying, all that kind of stuff was part of um, uh, the keynote of that particular d d group. And I still embrace a lot of that, but the fundamental part about hell and an angry God or a God with a terrible anger management problem <laughs> yes. uh, who throws tantrums, whether that's uh, cancer or AIDS or eternal torture chambers, I moved away from all of that kind of excess. And I still embrace the, the belief in a transcendent reality mm -hmm. that goes beyond religion, goes beyond human frailties and weaknesses and, and uh, parameters, mm -hmm. and that you can, you can uh, access your spirit through your spirit and be free. Right, and, right. And that's what upset um, a lot of the, my fundamentalist people who believe that only Christians were going to heaven and that everybody else was going to hell. Even my, my, my evaluations of heaven and hell have shifted and continue mm -hmm. to unfold as I do. Right. So it's a freeing evolutionary journey that I'm on right now, and I'm happier than I've ever been in my life. That's great. That's great. If you've just tuned in, you are listening to a man talking about heaven and hell, and that is Bishop Carlton Pearson. He's my guest today on Take My Advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa. And if you're tuning in and you are religious and it is working for you, then fabulous, and you really don't need to listen anymore. I brought Bishop Carlton on here because there is, there are many, 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 many people like myself who did grow up fundamental. I grew up fundamental Baptist, and I, you know, went to church like six days a week, and 
I got to a point where it wasn't working for me. The anger, the, the God that was angry all the time, who was going to send my grandfather, who did not believe in him, to hell, wasn't working. I want to say, like, Bishop Pearson, Carlton, Carlton, yeah. There's a, there's a lot of stuff there. But welcome to the show. I'm so glad that you could make it. And you are Skyping in from... Tulsa, Oklahoma. Tulsa, Oklahoma. Peace in and Wait. peace out. <laughs> place I've lived for 43 years, even though I was born in San Diego, and I should—I was out there last weekend, and I need to be there now. Yeah, so. yeah, I saw that in the bio. I had no idea. We should have nabbed you when you were out here, but this is good. Thank yeah. you to Skype. So I'm going to start with a, a, a question. Actually, it's a my friend. She doesn't have an answering machine, and when she calls the end, when you call her, her questioning machine comes on. It says, "Who are you?" And what do you want? So that's my first question in today's interview. Who are you and what do you want? Well, what I want is me. I'll answer that part first. Um, what I always, I have a chapter in one of my books titled What You Want Wants You because what you want actually is you. You want to experience the most precise and accurate, exact uh, realization of who you are, not the impersonation and not the imposter that we tend to become in life trying to be what everybody else anticipates or expects mm -hmm. or even demands. But at 62 years old, I've come to the realization that all I've ever wanted is to experience the total me, the most uh, precise and, and accurate and exact and uh, honest, earnest, pure, unedited, me. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't always like that, because uh, when I heard you speak for many, many years, you became what was expected of you and what maybe fed your ego. So I want to take all my listeners back. Some of I know I've got a lot of Agape Love Burrito peeps tuned in because they loved your talk at Agape. And I also have a very large listening base that is non-Agape. So I want to give um, you I, I, I'm going to start with a rumor. OK, so the rumor and then you correct the rumor with the truth. So when I first heard about you, the rumor was that you were this really, really, really big uh, uh, TV, TV media evangelist. You would hold these huge meetings and, you know, you you were a charismatic uh, very uh, born again, Pentecostal, you know, speaking in tongues, holy roller, if I can use that term, uh, very successful, had a following tens, 50,000, huge, huge. And then something happened and you were not okay with the gospel as you were preaching it. And you had like a little burning bush, uh, private burning bush experience and woke up and now preach uh, this this gospel of inclusion. And so your your words against Satan, uh, I know you did a program on Nightline with um, Deepak Chopra uh, about Satan, and then you've spoken out against religion, against gays, 